Okay, so hopefully this is our last recording for this chapter, but um, this idea of, again, racism and uh, with the environment uh, is, is certainly documentable. Uh, you don't just have to take a, a picture of it. It's looking at uh, people percent, uh, percent people of color and toxic air releases. And so I'm going to show you what some of those are, those releases are. Uh, but this one is showing you here within one mile, one to two and a half miles and more than two and a half miles away uh, from uh, the po um, air, you know, air pollutants. Sorry, this is, this is from your textbook. Um, I was looking at, uh, sorry, thinking about why, why you have minorities, that is African American and, and Latino, Asian and other closer, whereas the whites are further away from these things. Well, there's a couple of reasons. Well, one, the white flight that happened in the 60s and thereafter of, of whites fleeing to the suburbs, that's moving them away from industry, uh, chemical releases, toxins. Um, and I got a I got a thing here. Uh, I'm going to show a table. I'll show you specific to an area, but um, you know uh, the white flight is is part of that. And there's another thing too. When we start talking about inside cities of oh, we're going to run a road through here, or a rail spur, or a pipeline, or whatever. Well, what don't usually uh, minority inner city communities have disposable income to you know to pay for a lawyer to say no, don't run this through our neighborhoods. Um, Whereas, of course, white people are affluent enough uh, to pay for the lawyers will make sure that it goes somewhere else on you know, the other side of the tracks, as it, as it were. So uh, in the Bay Area, I found this one. So this is at Hunter's Point uh, Power. So if you look at their uh, emissions here, uh, you know, nitrous, uh, nitrogen oxide is one of the big uh, pollutants they release, uh, carbon monoxide. Of course, you know that's a toxic gas too in concentrations. You you can suffocate. Look at the long-term potential effects too. PM10 and PM2.5. It means particulate matter. So uh, of 10 microns, you can inhale, but it will get down to the smallest part of your lungs. Even more so would be those particulate matter of 2.5 microns, which may get all the way down to your alveoli. And this is a collective thing where you have pollutants in your lungs. They're not going to work efficiently. And this may shave years off of your life. It may not kill you, obviously, right away, but it may. Ammonia, though, can kill you right away, uh, NH3. Um, volatile organic compounds, the VOC there, and even a sulfur dioxide. So these kinds of releases are problematic for the people living in those areas. And those typically are minorities and people, you know, people of color. So this is a picture I'd found from an article of how a lot of this is being cleaned up now. They are, people are recognizing that all people deserve clean air. All people deserve clean water. They, you know, so um, doing the right thing is difficult when it costs money. Um, but doing the right thing is always the right thing. So this was their new campground they've got there uh, near Candlestick, uh, you know, Point State Recreational Area there. This was just a year or so ago. All right, moving forward here and demarcate, <coughs> demarcating uh, ethnic spaces. You get this uh, idea of the ethnic flag. Uh, and so this is a flag, not an actual flag, but one that denotes, hey, this is our particular area. So you can read about that in the textbook, but I also wanted to follow up with uh, Biron's color theory. Now, I don't think this is discussed in the book, but wanted to show you how, um, I, to be honest, I couldn't find any other actual uh, ethnic flags like this granary here. Uh, so I picked one that was obviously more readily apparent. And, and that was with actual flags. And so as it's mentioned here in the writing about um, Arab flags, uh, lots of them using white, black, green, and red, um, you know, uh, as, as, as representation of who they are. You'll also see uh, religious acts, aspects. Uh, Protestants in, in Northern Ireland go for orange, whereas the Irish Catholics, they go with green. Uh, green is absolutely a color of Muslim society, 
uh, that is until you get to prayer on Friday at the Jama Masjid, uh, then they'll be wearing white. And even the Dutch, nothing about them says orange, uh, but that has become their color. And largely along the line of the House of Orange or William of an orange. So uh, I want to show you this. These are those. These are ten flags uh, of countries. Now I'll show you what the answers are, but you probably want to record this because I swear you'll see it again. But look, you got ten different countries here that basically have the same structure of a flag. Uh, there's only one or two there that don't maybe have green associated with it, but green is Islam, white is peace and purity, and and so forth and so on. Um, but if, when you look at these, you know. Uh, I didn't. I had to actually look up a couple of these, even though I, I like to think I'm a vexillologist. You'll have to look that one up too. But uh, I knew some of these, but I had to look them up. So I'm saving you the uh, the time. So, but look at again the color and what it meant for people identifying with that color. So uh, when you look at the this is uh, the Dutch, and they have they've just cornered the market on orange. Uh, their soccer teams and their international sports racing track and field it's always orange all right uh, looking at some of these ethnic neighborhoods and food ways and some different things to wrap up the chapter uh muslim neighborhoods pakistani or arab it doesn't matter uh there's several uh, key features that you'll see here though uh the green is ever present because of islam halal means is like kosher is to jews it's blessed process it's food and halal meat means it was it was done in a religious uh way and thus it's nourishing to the body because allah saw that it was done correctly uh you'll see arabic here you'll see this crescent moon here because their lunar calendar uh but this is there's a lot of uh messages being conveyed here about this place uh, that you would want to come here uh, we we offer everything and it's exactly as you would uh as you would wish it. Uh, look up Bismillah. Bismillah as well. All right. Uh, urban landscapes, uh, ethnic urban landscapes, a lot of uh, motifs in the uh, west and southwest of the United States. Uh, Mexican American, of course, uh, neighborhoods. Um, uh, demarcating turf, but also uh, presenting religious uh, themes, very colorful themes. Uh, very different. I mean, you know, you look at some of these some of these uh, white communities and the houses we build, uh, they build tans and browns and all earth tones all the time. Uh, they, they, we might think that these colors on these fences are garish. Oh my gosh, it's, it's overload here. I don't know. I kind of like it. And I'm not saying I'm going to paint my house pink and blue, um, you know, but some of this is, uh, you know, the spice of life and uh, talking about political ideologies through this, about breaking the chains of oppression, as this image shows, m should make sense. And so you do see those very often. Uh, I'll be brief on this one just because they had it in the textbook, but um, building a city intended for all, uh, great design, poor execution. Um, this is a very... Uh, split city, this new capital they hacked out of the frontier uh, for Brasilia. Uh, it, it was designed in the same way Washington, D.C. was designed by L'Enfant. Uh, this one's an airplane and a something or other and a cross. Uh, you also have the cross motif with the Washington Monument in D.C. with the Jefferson Memorial in the White House on one end, the Capitol Building and the Lincoln Memorial on the other end. So it does have a plan, but it doesn't necessarily function like they thought it might and perform the task that they hoped it would. Uh, I will say this, too. I went ahead because I'm working ahead out of uh, the second edition of this textbook, and they did add this stuff in. So I don't want it to seem like I'm overkill here with uh, issues of, of, of race in American society. But gosh, it's hard to get away from. And now it's in included in the textbook one of the things that does stand out here when we start to look at history and race and culture think about how the south won the war and you'd say well they didn't it was uh you know the north won it they ended slavery and so forth and so on uh but redefining that that lost cause uh with monuments uh there's monuments stretching over a good bit of this country i think there's one out in idaho even for you know 
I don't even know if Idaho was a state, <laughs> to be honest, in 1860 to 60, you know, 1861, 1865, the, the, when the Civil War was happening. But there's monuments that people have paid for that, you know, um, talk about how great General Lee was and how, you know, beneficent they were to their slaves. And, but, but this is this is a this is a false narrative. It's a, it's a myth. It's made up. It's and so I could send you and I probably should give you some links to look um, into this idea of the lost cause. But gosh, there's any number of documentaries, uh, lots of books. I don't know if you want to read them all, but this is claiming a loss was actually going to be a victory, kind of, and and reclaiming. Uh, this so the removal of uh, statues is going on uh, but there used to be a lot you know uh, right after Civil War reconstruction a lot of African Americans were serving in the House and the Senate and especially in South Carolina and then uh, as the Republicans which was Lincoln uh, which was Johnson which was Grant uh, I don't know about Johnson but Grant uh, but you'd also see them then uh, turn their backs on on uh, on Reconstruction and turn their backs on these people as the Republican Party splits for it. And you would certainly then again see the rise of the Klan and Reconstruction being undone all the way around. Uh, it's long history. Take a history class. I don't know enough to tell you anymore. Um, we certainly see this, uh, this map in the textbook as well, showing you the uh, individuals who are, are black, who are killed at a higher uh, proportion. And we see that it's in lots of different places. So when you see um, these biases being brought in and the police still not, you know, training on chokeholds that, that have killed, um, gosh, I can't even remember all the names now, the, the, the fellow they choked to death on the sidewalk, that they put the, the neck uh, compression by putting the knee in the back of uh, George Floyd's neck. Um, I'll come back to that. Uh, sorry, um, uh, Brianna Taylor, for goodness sakes, being shot to death in her own home, uh, and no charges were filed about her, even though she was killed, the charges that were filed were for the neighbors who were imperiled by the bullet holes ripping through them, uh, through the walls. Uh, it just doesn't make any sense, and why would you pay $12 million to her family if you didn't do something wrong? Um, so, this is writ large racism, but microaggressions was included as well. And this is the little daily things. Like, for instance, when I go into a store and I pay for something with a credit card and the, the clerk doesn't ask me for my ID, but yet when the black guy behind me comes up to pay for his stuff as I'm walking out, I hear the clerk say, uh, do you have your identification on you, sir? You know, it doesn't sound like much, but the accumulation of these little microaggressions can certainly weigh on a person. And, and as a person uh, who is white, I just know it exists, and I know I don't have to suffer it, but I still don't like the fact that it occurs in my country. Uh, and there's a lot of other stuff to be upset about, clearly, with uh, all the killings. Um, so there's some disparities that need to be... Um, rectified. I'm going to wrap up here. I don't have enough time, but you can read in here. Cuban Americans and others, Nicaraguans, Hondurans are coming into um, uh, Miami and changing the com the complexion of Miami even more um, as the immigrants come on in. And looking at foodways here, guys, uh, all the different kinds of restaurants and when do they become American? Uh, for instance, uh, Mex you know, Taco Bell. Is that really Mexican food anymore? Are we talking about an American version of it? Um, if you look here in this picture, this is called jackfruit in some place called durian. Uh, I've eaten it before, but I won't ever eat it again. It stinks to high heaven. It's a yellow fleshy fruit. But there's lots of cool things like lychees and others that you need to try uh, that would never show up on our store shelves. You need to go to a, a, an Asian or ethnic uh, other kind of restaurant, grocery and whatnot to get them. And so uh, I would strongly encourage all of you, you know, 
that those those two statements there of tell me what you eat and I'll tell you who you are, but also a person who has not traveled widely thinks his mother is the best cook, and I have loved that uh, quote since the very first time I encountered it. Please travel, please share. Food is the thing that ties us all together, even if we are of a different uh, race or ethnicity. All right, guys, we're done. See you next time. Bye-bye.